I saw some funny looking faces, so I just wanted to make sure I didn't go any further. Um, we've been talking about pleasing God, and um, Pastor Tom's done a great job of speaking clearly on what pleasing God means, and um, uh, hopefully if you've been here listening, you're not confused thinking that's how I get to heaven and that's how I you know, get on and live eternal life with Jesus. Hopefully we're, we're past that based on his message. But we're going to be looking at one primary uh, group of scriptures this morning, and that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to read verse 1 to 15. I'm actually reading out of the ESV translation this morning, the English Standard Version. So if you'd like to follow along out of that, you can look it up on your Bible app, uh, the ESV. Or you can text notes to the number on the screen. Or you can access them via our digital worship program. So several different ways for you to access those. But uh, looking forward to this message. It's powerful. So let, let's get going. Wow, y'all gave me 45 minutes on that timer? That ain't right, is it? Okay. I don't think I'm supposed to have 45 minutes, but it's okay. It's not going to be a 45-minute message. It's like an hour long, so. (laughs) 2 Corinthians chapter 5. (laughs) Honey, I knew we shouldn't have come to church this morning. I knew we should have stayed at home and had coffee in our jammies. I'm just kidding. All right. You guys ready to read? All right. Verse 1. For we know that if the tent that that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent, that's our earthly body, we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. That's our heavenly body. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. So this is one thing that the Bible is strictly against, is the stoic philosophy of this evil, wicked body that we have, and it's like a prison for us. No, the Bible talks about we are not disembodied spirits, but we will be embodied spirits. That body, soul, spirit, all of these that we are one, God created all of it, and we're not going to be taking off this body, but rather, as we'll see, this body will be swallowed up with life. He says, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. Say that again, come on. We are always of good courage. Always. That's amazing. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others, but what we are is known to God. And I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but rather live for him who for their sake died and was raised. There are three main points that I want to extract and unpack from this body of scripture. Number one is revealing, Paul reveals to us what the supreme aim of the Christian life is, followed by how that now reduces everything else to sheer insignificance. And number three, the motivation, the why behind this aim we have. The first point, what is the supreme aim of the Christian life is found in verses 6 to 9. He says we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage and would rather be away from the body and home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, whether you are on earth or in heaven, whether it is right now, or in eternity, the, the sheer and supreme aim of the Christian life is to please the Lord. Listen, this is an aim that doesn't change when you die. 
You have loved ones that have gone to be with the Lord and they're with him right now. And guess what purpose they have to bring pleasure to him. And they're not living in regret because God wipes away all tears. But if they had regret, they would realize that, man, I lived life on earth without that same purpose. And Paul is revealing to us that the purpose and the supreme aim of the Christian life doesn't change when we die, but it is right now the supreme aim of the Christian life to bring pleasure to God, to please him. Now, the funny thing about aiming is you know if you hit it. Right? Uh, imagine Pastor Tom in the silly. I know he shot an eight on that par three. You know, <laughs> he's not that good. He needs improvement. But imagine if he was to show up to the park. Imagine if he was just to show up to a park, your Belinda Regional, with his, with his clubs and a golf ball. Guess what? He doesn't have anything to aim at because there's no flagpole. So he could be swinging away, and he could be hitting pretty good balls. But he's accomplishing nothing. See, the Christian life isn't beating the air, as Paul says in chapter 10. He says, no, it's with direct aim, purpose. It's, it's, it's intentionality that he said it is my supreme aim to please God. So here is the target, and what are we aiming for in our life? It is to bring pleasure to Jesus. Now, here's what a fanatic is. You know, fans and fanatics. A fanatic in a negative way, a true fanatic is this. A true fanatic is a person who, having lost sight of his goal, redoubles his effort to get there. It doesn't make sense, right? That's called a fanatic. And my concern is that, that, that we have a lot of Christians doing that very thing. We, we've got aims. Some people aim to be successful. Some people aim to be very smart. Some people aim to be very rich. Some people aim to be very comfortable. You know, some people aim for, for whatever it is. We, some people aim, I need to get married. That's my aim. I, I need a spouse, and then I'll be happy. Some people are just aiming for happiness. And, and we all have aims, and guess what? Some of y'all get there. But then what Paul reveals is there's one day you'll be standing before the Lord, and you'll realize none of that mattered. You had the wrong aim your whole life. There's one aim. Don't you love the simplicity of the gospel? The simplicity of the... There is one aim for the Christian life, and that is to please God. The only acceptable, and this is non-negotiable, aim of the believer is to live a life pleasing to God. I want to dig a little bit deeper into this word aim, because we kind of miss it in its English translation of just simply aim. But listen to this of what it means in the, in the, in the Greek. The word here used means properly... To love honor, to be ambitious. This is its usual classical signification. In the New Testament, it means to be ambitious, to do something, to exert oneself, to strive as if, and I'm going to foreshadow, from a love or sense of honor. As in English, to make it a point of honor to do so and so. So this aim is inferring honor. Man, would we do well to have a, a revival of honor in our society, of, of children honoring their parents, of, of people honoring one another above themselves. He says it means here that Paul made it a point of constant effort. It was his leading and constant aim to live so as to be pleasing to God and to meet his approval wherever he was. You say, Paul, man, you were just beaten almost to death. You were stoned to death. Everywhere you go, you're imprisoned and you have chains and persecution. Why are you doing this? Why don't you take a break? Why don't you take a vacation, bro? Why don't you go retire up in the Alps of is Italy, you know? Go up there and relax a little. He said, no, 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 because my sole purpose the sole principle that guided his life was, is, am I pleasing God? That was everything. 
The very supreme principle that guided his actions, his behaviors daily. The very purpose of his life. The reason he woke up in the morning. The reason he went about doing good. The reason why he did what he did was because everything in his life had to be reoriented and recalibrated to his main principle and purpose, which was pleasing to God. It wasn't about just doing what was good. Is, is this best? Is this pleasing to God? Everything aligned, had to align to what was pleasing to God. Now, in this verse, he doesn't explicitly state what it is that's pleasing to God. But if we take the context of First and Second Corinthians, we find six things, very briefly, of things that Paul says are his purpose in pleasing God. Number one is speaking boldly the gospel. What is speaking boldly the gospel? It is not being loud and it is not being mean. To speak boldly the gospel is to speak fearlessly. It's to not be afraid of persecution, to not be afraid of men and what they can do, but to speak fearlessly the good news of Jesus. Number two is taking with courage the sufferings that then follow you preaching the gospel boldly. The, 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 the thing that pleases God is that when you are experiencing sufferings and persecution, you persevere by the grace and power of Jesus Christ, continuing to rejoice in the midst of sufferings because of the promised hope that he has given you. That brings him pleasure. Number three, living by faith. Uh, Pastor Tom spent two weeks talking about how living by faith brings pleasure to God. In fact, it's impossible to please God without faith. Number four, avoiding idolatry. Idolatry displeases God. What is idolatry, you ask? Idolatry is anything that you seek to give you what only God can. Idolatry is you seeking satisfaction and fulfillment from something other than God. Some people are seeking fulfillment from other people. And they can idolize their kids. They can idolize their spouse as if they are El Jefe, the Savior, the giver of all. And we can idolize money because of what money gives us. We can idolize comfort. We can idolize happiness thinking that those things will truly fulfill you. And that is called idolatry. Idolatry is not, is, is not depending on God for your total fulfillment and satisfaction. Number five. That, bring, that he brings out here, is everything he did was to bring glory to God. Everything he did wasn't to enhance his ministry. It wasn't to enhance Paul's name. It wasn't to, so that people could look at Paul and say, man, Paul, you're awesome. In fact, he got just the opposite. But everything he did was to bring glory to the Lord Jesus. I pray that Church of Grace, that everything we do with Team Grace, with our small groups, with our growth track, with the people on stage, and when we're out in the, in the parking lots and in our jobs and our businesses, that everything we are doing is to bring glory Glory to the Lord Jesus, because if you don't catch it now, eventually you're going to have to learn how to do that in heaven, because that's what we'll be doing, giving glory and honor to him. And number six, finally, is by living out the message of Christ, reconciling death. Paul said in Philippians chapter three, verse 10, he said, my purpose is to know him and the power of his resurrection. And watch this, the fellowship of of his sufferings. Jesus is inviting you to know him, and when you come to him, he shows you a cross. It is putting off the old man, dying to the old, and putting on the new. It is a constant death. It is a constant killing off of selfish ambition. It is killing off of what Josh wants, Josh is king, and taking on what Jesus wants, what Jesus as king. And that when we kill off the old and put on the new, we are be being conformed into the likeness of his death. Those are six brief things of what Paul brings out in the book of 2 Corinthians of what brings God pleasure, of what his purpose and his goal is, which leads then to the second point that Paul takes us on this journey in verses, back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 10 to 11. He says, for, it is our supreme aim to be pleasing to the Lord, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, 
we persuade others. Now, this is in direct contrast to the system of the world, which goes like this. Due to the fear of man, I'm persuaded to act a certain way, right? The powers of the world, Caesar calls you and instructs you what to do and how to live because he is offering you salvation, he's offering you prosperity, but he's also offering you the knife if you don't want to listen. And so, so many Christians back in that day, they could tell apart who was really a Christian and who wasn't by who bowed the knee, Many Christians fear man more than they fear God. Now notice this, that the fear of God will lead you to do something. The fear of God persuades us and moves us to act. The fear of God here is not talking about terror, being scared of God, being terrified of him, which would make you run away from him. Like the Israelites at Mount Sinai, when they saw God, they ran away because they were terrified. But the New Testament fear of God is a worshipful reverence of his greatness. It is living with a reverence of God that says, God, I care more about what you think than I do about him. God, I care more about what you say is right than I do what society says is right. The fear of God will lead you to sometimes look like you are living out of your mind. The world, Paul says, doesn't understand that you don't live that life of sin anymore. That you aren't partaking in parties and drunkenness and orgies and all kinds of stuff. They find it weird and they think you're strange because you're not partaking of that stuff. And then persecution follows. But do you live with the fear of man Or do you live with the fear of God? Who do you reverence more? There's coming a day that Paul is saying when we are standing before the Lord and we will realize that the only thing that ever mattered was what he thought was good. Paul is saying that we will all stand before the Lord and in that moment, we're, oh my goodness, the only thing that mattered, all those people that thought I was crazy and I bowed my knee to them and I did what they wanted me to do and I, I conformed to the world and their system so that I wouldn't be persecuted, so that I wouldn't look like I was weird, all, none of that mattered. The only thing that matters today and for eternity is what pleases him. That's it. And Paul wasn't just saying it, he's living it, because here's the, here's the thing. He said, when we have the reverence of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, we act. We, we, we do something. What do we do? We persuade others. See, what happens is when you live a life pleasing to people, you end up living a life of compromise. And when you live a life of compromise... You stop being the very salt and light that God needs you to be to be effective in persuading others of his majesty. So if I live a life to please people, I will fail in my calling to represent Christ to them. So I can't live a life of compromise. Why? Because the very people I'm trying to please are dependent on me not compromising so that I can show them the Lord. So you think you might be winning a friend, but what you're losing is a friend for eternity because you're trying to be liked. Why? Because you fear more them, you reverence them more than you do God. (laughs) I'm I'm preaching to myself here, right? We all, you, you ever meet someone that says, yeah, I don't like being liked. Get away from them because they they, they, out, they out there. They got some problems. We, we like to be liked. We're, we're, we're made, God made us to be accepted. But accepted and liked and care and reverence the right one. Him and only him. Which will then lead you to live a life of boldness. Which again isn't being mean or loud. It's being fearless. Not being afraid of losing my, my, my head. Not being afraid of losing my job. Not being afraid of losing a friend. Not being afraid of losing, losing, losing. Why? Because my God is even the God of what I lost. And if it was lost, God can bring it back seven times over. Did Job not teach us that? What am I afraid of? What do you have to fear, friend? What do you have to fear, saint? 
What you should fear and reverence is the almighty God who has the power to destroy not just body, but soul. And that comes from the mouth of Jesus. So Paul is saying, I I line everything up to live a life that's pleasing to him. Look what he says in Galatians 1.10. He says, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, listen to this, I would not be a servant of Christ. I would not be a servant of Christ. You cannot be a servant of Christ and also seek to please everybody else. They do not go together. You either say, you know what, I'm going to seek to please God, and y'all can think I'm crazy, but I love you. Y'all can think I'm weird, but you know what? I don't care because there's coming a day when I really won't care because it'll just be me and the Lord. And I only want to hear one thing. Well done, you were good and pleasing to the world. No, I don't want to hear that. I want to hear well done, good and faithful servant. My servant, Jesus says, you're mine, Josh. You're my servant. You didn't bow the knee to Caesar. You didn't bow the knee to the world. You didn't bow the knee to compromise. You stood boldly and loved the world and cared about them so you didn't compromise. You were the salt and you were the light. And look at all the people your life influenced to come into the kingdom too. That's what I want to hear on that day. But it makes me make that decision today. That decision won't be made for you tomorrow. It's either made today or it's not made at all. I have to wake up today saying, I'm going to align my life with only that which pleases the Lord, which means it's going to take some dying, some cutting away of things in your life that don't please him, some relationships that don't bring him pleasure, some things you do that don't bring him pleasure, and start saying, does this please the Lord? And I'm going to do it. Paul is reminding us that we're going to answer to him, the Lord, and him only. But here's the thing, is that God's not just seeing the behaviors and the actions of our life that bring him pleasure. It's not just the what you do, but it's actually the heart with which you do it. And that's a big deal. Because there's a lot of people I could be preaching to you right now, and you think, man, that's good, Josh. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at Josh, man, he's really serving the Lord. But you don't know what's in my heart. I could be doing this for selfish gain. I could be doing this so that my name gets bigger. I could be doing this to seek applause from you because that makes me feel better. I could be doing it for the wrong reasons. And watch this, God isn't gonna judge the action. He's gonna judge the heart. He's gonna say, Josh, I saw what you were doing. That was good, but man, you were doing it out of selfish ambition. You're doing it with the wrong heart. See, what God wants to do isn't just change behaviors and change symptoms. He wants to get to the root of the issue in your heart and transform you to where you are doing and pleasing him, not out of obligation, but out of love. He says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, he says, for our appeal, our persuasion of, of people, us preaching the gospel to you, does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. Not to please man, but to please God who is testing our hearts. He says back in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12 and 13. He says, we are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not what about is in the heart. And so what Paul, what Paul is battling, what Paul is, is after right now is this church in Corinth is trying to be persuaded by people that want to look as good as they can with outward appearances. And what Paul is saying is, look, they might look good right now, They might be persuasive right now, but what really matters is what's going on in the heart. He says in verse 13, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we are in our right mind, it is for you. He's saying, I may sometimes seem as though I'm out of my mind, but if that's the case, it's because I'm working for God, not for you. 
He says, sometimes I'm deadly sober and serious, and that's when I have to deal with you. But all of it, and this goes to my final point, point number three, all of this leads to the motivation, the ambition, the why behind living a life that's pleasing to the Lord. What makes you get up in the morning? What is it that at the bottom of your heart is the ambition to achieve that which you are aiming for? He said, I know what it's like to have an ambition to be wealthy and successful. There was a time where I couldn't wait to get up in the morning because, man, I wanted to read a business book. I wanted to grow a business. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to retire by age 30. And I wanted to have a lot of money so I could do whatever I want. And it drove me towards that goal. I didn't have to try hard. The ambition in my heart to want to be that drove me. What is the ambition and the drive and the why in our heart that will drive you not towards some wrong aim, but to the one supreme aim of bringing pleasure to Christ? And before I answer the, what it is, let me tell you what it isn't. What it isn't, number one, is the fear of judgment. There are many a Christians that said yes to the prayer of Jesus out of fear of judgment, right? Fire insurance. I just don't want to go to hell. Where are they today? Now, some have maintained and some came to the truth of the gospel that it was about relationship with the Lord, but many didn't. Many are lost and they're out there not serving the Lord. Why? Because they got their fire insurance. They're good. Thank you. It does not last. Tim Keller on the fear of judgment and why it is an ineffective motivator says this. Our motivation that's by fear of judgment will lose its power over time. Fear as an emotion is very draining. It moves you to great feats at first, but eventually it is exhausting. People who live in great fear experience a numbing effect after a while. Slowly one becomes too tired to care, indifferent to what happens. Fear-based religion therefore often tends to be short-lived. The second reason why fear-based Religion doesn't work, the fear of judgment. He says that fear-based obedience, right? I'm obeying because I'm afraid of what might the consequence be if I don't. Fear-based obedience has a great deal of trouble with repentance. When we are motivated by fear, we believe that somewhere there is a line. If we sin too much, we cross it and God will condemn us. But we don't know where that line is. And as a result... Repentance is not a sweet thing, but something very bitter. We don't have the security now because we don't know where that line is and we don't know where we stand with God because we're afraid. So now we don't have the security to admit our sins for fear of reprisals from God. So we do a lot of rationalizing and a lot of blaming. That's what small groups are about, is when we create this environment for relationship creation. When you get together with other Christians and you meet them in a non-condemning atmosphere, but rather a healing atmosphere, and you can confess with trust and love your faults to one another, God promises he will heal you. It is not an if, it is not a maybe, it is a promise from on high that if you get into a real life connection, a real life relationship without fear of failure without fear of judgment and you confess it see God can't heal what's kept secret and there's so many Christians not connected not in relationship that have a closet full of secrets and you're worried that God's going to condemn you for them he's waiting for you to bring them out of the closet with someone you can trust so he can heal you he wants you well he wants you whole He doesn't want you carrying around the baggage of guilt and condemnation and shame. Those are not in his tool belt. He does not use that to motivate us. And number three, fear-based obedience will always make it difficult to endure suffering or troubles. The fear-based person will either think, God is paying me back. God has abandoned me. Maybe I crossed the line this time. Or, this isn't fair. God, I've been good. I've been tithing. I've been serving. Why did you let this happen to me? What are you experiencing? Fear-based religion. I obey God so that he will bless me. 
and so that these bad things won't happen. And if I can remind you, God doesn't promise you everything will be perfect right now. The perfect is coming. What he does promise you is a cross. What he does promise you by his grace is suffering for not compromising and bowing the knee to Caesar. But if we're fear-based religion, our obedience will come so that he can bless me and the bad things won't happen and that's not in the Bible. Fear-based religion does not work. The other reason, the other thing that does not move Paul and motivate the Christian is theory. This is not just something Paul agrees with. This is not just theory of the gospel. They are not asking for you to just agree that Jesus is king and that there is a God. Nowhere in the Bible are we asking just to agree. But Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 said something very different than just theory. This isn't just theory to Paul. This is lifestyle. This is real. This is living out the gospel in everyday life. He says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, you all know it very well. He says, therefore... It, because of the mercies of God. What, Paul? What mercies? He just spent 11 chapters in Romans talking about the gospel. The greatness of God's mercy to you. The greatness of God's grace to you. How he saved you. How he loved you. And Paul says, now look, all of this, I'm not asking you just to agree with it. He says what? Do you not have that verse? Oh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. You don't have it? I'll read it for you. Romans chapter 1 and 2. I guess I don't have it. Therefore, he says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercies, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is the same one that says you are justified by faith. But as James clarifies, faith without works is... Many people have confused faith with agreement. Paul is not saying the Christian just says, yes, Jesus, and that's it. The yes, Jesus follows it up with your life on the altar. There is only one appropriate response from the believer. When you hear about the grace of God, the goodness of God, the gospel, the great mercies of God, is to lay your life on the altar, not as a dead sacrifice, but as a living sacrifice. Which, what does Paul say it does? It's holy and pleasing to God. What pleases God? What is the supreme aim of the Christian life? To lay your life down on the altar as a living sacrifice. It's not just theory. It's not just doctrine. It's living this theory and this doctrine out in real life. For, for Paul... The resurrection, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus was not just a bedtime story. It was a real life event that happened in space, time, and matter that changed the universe for all eternity. And Paul says, because that event happened, everything is different today. And I'm going to live my life that reflects my faith in that event and not treat it as if it's just some story. It was a real life event that changed the universe for all time. And when we believe that, it does something. It's alive, it's living. It gets into the deep innermost parts of your heart and begins to change you and begins to transform you to where you lay your life on the altar and say, God, I reverence you. God, my life, the supreme aim of my life, my purpose, my principle, living each day is to bring pleasure to you. That's what the gospel does. What is it then that motivates us? What is it then that moves us? Moves us to serve the body of Christ. What is it that causes us to get involved here in the local body with team grace and small groups? What is it that moves us to serve one another in love? What is it that moves us out of the pew and into the streets? What is it that moves us from living a life of selfish ambition to living a life of ambition of the Lord and towards his kingdom and his call? What is it that moves you? It is not trying harder. It is not praying more. It is one thing. And Paul says in verse 14 and 15, he says, For the love of Christ 
controls us. It is not the fear of judgment. It is not just theory. It is something real and something that is more powerful that can break the stoniest heart. It is not your love for him. It is the love of him. It is the love from him. Something very real that was expressed on that cross when Jesus hung there. Paul can see that. And in Galatians 2.20, he says, the life that I now live in the body, I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What is the motivator that causes you to get up in the morning and say, I'm not gonna fear man, I'm not gonna compromise, I'm gonna fear the Lord, I'm gonna reverence him, and I'm gonna serve him, and I'm gonna make it my aim to be pleasing to him. What is it, trying hard? No, it is the very love of Christ. It is the very love of Christ that Paul says, will then cause you to no longer live for yourself, but for him who died and was raised. That's the Christian life. That's all that's acceptable, that God wants, that brings him pleasure. It's freedom from all that held us back before, all the baggage and the pain the running around purposelessness with with no purpose and aimless and then doubling your efforts to get there. And here Paul has revealed to us, not just theory, but in practice, what it means to be a Christian. What it means to say yes to the Lord, not just in theory, not out of fear of judgment, but out of the very love of Christ. It's his love that controls us. It's his love that moves us. It's his love that changes our hearts, that moves us into areas and things to do that don't seem normal. When you read Paul to the Thessalonians, he says, I am, I am caring about you with the very affection of Christ the Lord. That was saying, Paul, I'm not just caring caring for you with my own affection, but the very affection, the very love of Christ the Lord flowing through me to you. What is the Christian motivator? It's love. It's love. And my prayer, our prayer, and the mission of this church to know God. It's not just knowing about him, but intimately knowing him who is love and who laid it all out for you, who gave everything for you. And I pray that every one of us wouldn't take this message and say, okay, I'm gonna go try harder. That'll be short-lived. You might do well for a week or a month or something. But rather, you say, you know what? I'm gonna go rational, rationally. I'm gonna go think and meditate on this Jesus and his great love. The way people love money and moves them to get it, that comes from thinking about it, that comes from being taught it, that comes from learning the importance of it. Well, what if you started learning the importance of the love of your Savior? What if you started thinking about his love for you? What if you started spending time meditating and actually participating throughout the week by lifting your hands and worshiping him? What if we stopped treating Christianity as theory and and treating it as if it's real? And we actually begin to daily honor him and say, God, I wake up this morning and I'm not out to build my own thing. I'm not out to do what I want. I want to yield my life to you. I may not know what that looks like. I may not know how that happens. I may not have all the answers, God, but all you asked was for me to lay my life at the altar and that's what I'm doing. I trust that you will take care of the rest. I trust that you'll provide me with the power. I trust that you'll provide me with the grace. I trust that you'll provide me with the resources. I trust that you'll provide me with the perseverance, with the faithfulness, with the patience, with the provision, with everything I need to accomplish what you've called me to do. I'm not 
responsible for that. You are. I'm responsible for putting my life on the altar as a living sacrifice. May my life have the aim of pleasing you. If I could have every head bowed and eyes closed. If you've never made the Lord Jesus the Lord of your life, if he isn't presently your savior, maybe you're watching online and you want to learn more about this great love of Christ that he has for you, we want to help you on that journey. And it starts right now with the decision, with the commitment, with the prayer. And I want to lead you in that prayer. It's very simple. You just say, Father God, I ask you to save me. I believe that Jesus died on the cross and that he rose again from the dead. And I believe he died for my sins and my shame and my guilt. And that I can stand before you holy and clean. And I commit my life to you and to your hands. Help me walk. Help me grow and connect me with the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, if you're online or if you're in here, we wanna help you on your journey with the Lord. And what we have here is called Growth Track. And Growth Track tells you about our church and how to get connected to the body. But even more than that, we want to help you discover what God has put in your heart, your God-given purpose, so that you can then go and make a difference in the lives of others. Live a life fully pleasing to the Lord. And if you're in here, step three is today, right after service in room 103. And I encourage every one of you that haven't gone through it, that want to learn more about the history and the future of Church of Grace and what we're doing, maybe discover what God's put in your heart to, to attend. If you missed the first two, that's okay. You can go to number three. And if you're online, we are working diligently to get it virtually available to you so that you can join it as well. God bless you guys.